couple weeks ago, we finished our series on Revelation, A Vision of Hope, and there were some study notes that we would have in the bulletin each week, and what we've done is we've um, summarized all the background information from the series in this, again, these study notes, and you can pick one of these up at the information booth. This is a great resource if you want to keep it uh, in your Bible, just as a reminder of some of the um, background information from the series. You can pick that up, and then also... Um, For those of you who are at the Thanksgiving service, you may remember we issued a Thanksgiving challenge in which we are challenging you between now and Christmas, each day find 10 things to thank God for, each day. And then offer up, you know, a quick 10, 15 second prayer during your day as you, uh, as these things come to your mind. And we created these little cards that you can put in your wallet or purse or uh, put in some prominent place you can hang on your uh, bathroom mirror or your refrigerator at home or something like that. And so we ran out of cards actually at the Thanksgiving uh, service, so we made a few more, and you can pick one of these up at the information booth. And even if you weren't at the Thanksgiving service but would like to take up the challenge between now and and Christmas, I encourage you to do that as well. This morning we are beginning our uh, series on uh, in Advent, Advent 2014, and the title of the series is Hope Revealed. And it's a little bit of a, a, a piggyback, if you will, off of if Revelation was a vision of hope, Advent 2014 is hope revealed. And all the passages, at least the passage of the day for each Sunday, are going to come from the book of Isaiah. And um, again, in Revelation, we unpacked what hope looked like in Revelation. And, and during, in Isaiah, and through this series of hope revealed, we want to see what hope looks like this Advent. Uh, Our scripture reader for the day is Carol Hill. Carol, if you can make your way on up to the podium. And as she does so, I'm going to ask everyone who's able to please stand and face the center of the room. And we stand because we believe that this is the Word of God. And so, Carol, whenever you are ready, please read from Isaiah 43 to 8. Carol, great job. Thank you. You may be seated. I know it's almost cliche to say it's hard to believe it's that time of year again that we're already in, in Advent. And, and to me, as I think about and I've reflected upon uh, just different responses to Jesus' coming and what we celebrate uh, during the Christmas season, and... Um, it's interesting that some of, there's some parallel tracks between how we celebrate Christmas in general and how we view Jesus' coming. And um, I, I, this is, I'm sure, not the only three responses you can have to the coming of Jesus or to the Christmas season, but these are just three I came up with. And what I would love for you to do as I unpack them briefly is just kind of put yourself as best as you can in one of them. Which one of these three responses best describe you right now as you prepare to celebrate the coming of Jesus. Where are you at? Okay, I'm not going to ask you to confess anything. This is just a personal thing for you. But the first response that I sometimes find myself having and see others having when it comes to Jesus' coming is indifference. Indifference. And we're indifferent sometimes because not sure that Jesus' coming makes a difference all the time. You know, we go through the motions of at least Christmas celebration. You get your lights up, which, by the way, the weather this weekend would have been a great time to do that. If you missed it, sorry, it's cold now. I got mine up this weekend. Thank you very much. Um, But you get your lights up. You know, you start your shopping or get your shopping done, tree trimmed, 
um, cards sent out, the whole routine, and it becomes the same routine every year. Same songs, same traditions, same story. And honestly, it's easy to get tired of it. And even get to the point where it really doesn't matter. Does it really matter? And that's not a great attitude to have, but honestly, sometimes you wonder, does it really matter? Because we do this year in and year out, we celebrate the coming of Jesus, and it doesn't seem to change anything. It's the same thing every year. And so we find ourselves becoming indifferent, not sure that it really makes a difference. Another response is just simply we miss it. And we miss it because we're too busy to see the difference. We're just too busy. You know, we have things to do every year. There are goals to accomplish. There's work to be done, people to see and stay connected with. There are kids' activities to go to or grandkids to see and their activities to go to. And it's not like we make this conscious effort to miss it. It just happens. And we miss it because we're too busy to see the difference. The third response is that we prepare, using the language of the Scripture of the day. That, and we prepare because we expect the coming of Jesus to be the difference. Where we look for something different to happen. Or maybe we ask ourselves, what do I need to do different? Or what am I missing here? Where we pause and have a patient expectation. We look around and we wonder, what is God up to? What is God doing in my life? What's God doing in our community? What is God doing in the world? We expect the coming of Jesus to be the difference, and so we prepare and we look for it. So now where are you? Which one of these three descriptions? And again, this isn't, this isn't a test, it's just a time to pause. Where do you find yourself? Do you find yourself being indifferent? Do you find yourself realizing, hey, I'm missing this because I'm just too busy? Or do you find yourself, no, I'm honestly preparing. I'm expecting Jesus to be the difference. Where do you find yourself this morning? Advent 2014, where are you at? You know, the message in Isaiah 40, to the Israelites who would have received the message, I would not have blamed them at all for either being indifferent to hearing the message or being too busy and missing the message. Because the message in Isaiah 40, it's a message for the disillusioned. It really is. It's a message to the disillusioned. The prophet Isaiah is speaking to a time when the Israelites will be in exile. The Israelites were supposed to be in Israel. That's where they belonged. But in Isaiah 40, they weren't. They weren't in Israel. They were in exile. They were in captivity in a place called Babylon, a foreign land. The Babylonians in 586 conquered the Israelites, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and carried out the inhabitants of what remained in Israel to Babylon. And so their homes, their land, their history, all gone. And they are adjusting to a new culture, a new language, a new way of life. And so I wouldn't have blamed them. Wouldn't have blamed them at all for either being indifferent to this message of Isaiah or just being too busy to miss it. Because they had to be asking the question, what does the future hold for us? Look at what has happened to us. The Israelites should have been in Israel. They weren't. The Israelites should have been worshiping in the temple, and they weren't. 
Again, as I mentioned, when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple. And the temple was not just their center of worship. It was not just their center of faith. The temple was their visible reminder that God was with them. And when their visible reminder of God's presence with them is destroyed, what do you think the message is to them? Again, the best parallel I could come up with is what would happen to our national morale if the White House was destroyed? It's not our house. But what that means to our country, and if that were to be destroyed, what would that do to our morale? Well, the temple wasn't just the place where their political leader lived. It was where their God dwelt. And that place was destroyed. They should have been in Israel, they weren't. They should have been worshiping in the temple, they weren't. The Israelites should have been a light for all the nations, and they weren't. That was their purpose. The purpose was to be a light for all nations, for everyone to see what God expected of the world. But they were no longer a nation. They were a scattered people. And again, they had to be asking the question, well, what do we do now? Now what do we do? Who are we going to be? Our purpose has been shattered. Should have been in Israel. Should have been worshiping in the temple. Should have been a light. They had no future, apparently. Didn't have a real sense of purpose anymore. And I just wonder, do you have a list of should-be's? Of how your life is supposed to have been and it's not? You know, what, what are your should-be's? Maybe for some of us it's, well, my family life should be, but it's, it's not. Or my career, my career should be, it's not. My health, my health should be. It's not. What are your should be's? And maybe you are unsure of the future. Maybe you've even lost your sense of purpose. Regardless of what your should be's are or where you stand, this is a message for you because it's a message for the disillusioned. For the disappointed. And it's a message that's fulfilled in Jesus. It's a message of hope. As it says in verse 5, that God comes to us. It says that His glory will be revealed. It's a message of hope that God has not rejected those who have abandoned Him. And God is coming to reveal His glory worldwide. That's the message fulfilled in Jesus. And I want you to notice that when Isaiah says, prepare the way, prepare the way, he's not telling them, prepare the way for you to get out of your captivity. That's not what he says. He says, prepare the way for who? For the Lord. Prepare the way for the Lord to come to you. The Lord is coming to you. Coming to you in your captivity. Right where you are. Where you find yourself in life. God is coming to you. It's a picture of God's journey, not a picture of the people's journey. It's like preparing a road because the king is coming. The king is on his way. Get the road ready because he's coming. Now in our culture, there's this idea that we need to search out and find God. You know, and, and different people have different ideas of how this is supposed to look. We go on some lifelong journey 
in our search for God to find Him. And yet the truth is, God comes to you. God comes to us. He enters into our lives. Even if we find ourselves in some form of captivity, in some kind of darkness, we've got this long list of what our life's supposed to be like, and we're contrasting it with what it is. God comes to us in all of that. That's the message. God comes to you. It reminds me a little bit of, and again, I, it's Christmas time, so I go to mall illustrations, but it reminds me of a time where, and this never happened to me, but I've heard of many stories like this, where, you know, a little child goes to the mall with his parents or her parents, and it's going to be a great time, going to be hanging out with mom and dad, and maybe we'll get to see Santa, who knows, it's going to be a great time, but somewhere along the line, the child gets lost separated from the parents. And all of a sudden, the mall, which was going to be a wonderful place, becomes a very scary place. It becomes a big world that they don't know how to navigate in anymore. And they're terrified. And then after a period of time, they see mom coming, or they see dad coming. Their parents come to them. And what's interesting is they still don't know how to navigate the mall, okay? They're still totally lost. But they see their parents coming, and they know. They know mom and dad. They will help them through it. I still don't know how to navigate the mall, but mom and dad are here. I'm going to be okay. Life is good because mom is here or dad is here. I can't stand up here and tell you today that God's going to remove the scary place from your life. I don't know that. I can't promise you that. What I do know is that God will help you navigate it. God comes to you. And I, I don't know what it looks like for you, but whatever it is, God comes to you and he will help you navigate it. And I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to be okay. It's good that God will be with you. Life is good because God comes to us in our darkness, in our uncertainty, in our disappointment. And Jesus fulfills that. As it says in Matthew chapter 1, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus fulfills it. God came to us in Jesus, and Jesus still comes to us. It's a message of hope. It's a message of assurance. As it says in verse 8, that God's word endures forever. And when the scripture says, you know, people are like grass and their accomplishments are like the flowers in the field that wither. Well, it's contrasting God's word that endures forever with the temporary nature of the life that we experience. Again, what's the new fad? Who are the new famous people? The new powerful people? What's the new controversy? Whatever it is this year, I can almost guarantee it, it'll be different next year. And different the year after that. And different the year after that. But what hasn't changed in 2,000 years is that the light has come to the world. In Jesus. And the light is still in the world. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us. The light hasn't left. And while our captivity 
Whatever that looks like may change, and whatever our darkness, whatever that looks like, that may change. God coming to us in it, that stays the same. God's word endures forever. And again, Jesus fulfills this. John chapter 1. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Jesus fulfills it. Jesus, the living, walking word, still comes to us. It's also a message of urgency. As it says in verses 3 and 4, prepare the way. Prepare the way. In fact, John the Baptist echoed Isaiah's message when he saw the Lord coming. He acted as the voice calling. As it says in Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight and the rough ways smooth and all people will see God's salvation. Again, a common question that we get asked as followers of Jesus is, well, okay, how do I get to heaven again? What, what do we do? How do I get there? Again, that seems to be the focus. How do I get to heaven? How do I get to heaven? In Jesus, a big piece of heaven has come to us. The question shouldn't be, how do I get there? The question should be, how do I make room for him who's come to me, who's brought a piece of heaven with him? To us. How do I prepare the way for him to come into my life? The Lord has come to you. Have you prepared the way for him to come? Have you invited Christ to be in your life, to make him your Savior for the forgiveness of sins, to make him your Lord so that you may become more like him? God has come to us in our exile, in our captivity, in our darkness, whatever that may look like for us. And maybe you're having a good year. God bless you. God comes to you in that too. But for those of us who maybe find ourselves in some form of exile or captivity, I think a great question to ask is, do we want to be released? Or do we like our captivity? Again, our captivity is familiar. And if I want to be released, it may mean that I need to change, that God is calling me to do something different. Are we willing to celebrate Christmas but not open up to the one who comes at Christmas? Or really all year round, but we celebrate it at Christmas. How open are our hearts? To the one who comes. What do we need to do? What do I need to do? What do you need to do to prepare the way? What would it mean for Jesus to come into your life? What would it look like? How would it be the difference? Would you be more loving, more patient, more forgiving, more joyful? What would it look like? What is it that's getting in your way? And whatever that may be, is it really worth it? This Advent season, do an inventory. Is whatever is wor getting in your way, is it worth what it's costing you? Isaiah said and John echoed that the valleys need to be filled and the mountains need to be leveled and the crooked roads need to be made straight. So what valleys need to be filled in for you? What mountains in your life have to be leveled? 
What crooked roads need to be made straight? What are some things that are getting in the way of God coming? Or are we even looking? Are we even looking for Jesus' coming to make a difference? That life could be different for the better. To believe that if we trusted in Jesus to come into our darkness, that he will see us through it. Have we even considered that? The Son of God is the saving one. He saves us from our life of sin. The sin which has held us captive for far too long. And into our darkness, He has come to us. God with us. So prepare the way. Prepare the way to see hope revealed. This Advent, 2014, prepare the way to see hope revealed.